I've said before that I'm something of a counter-enlightenment type, um, and that takes some qualification, of course, because uh, you know I'm always praising the French Republic, which emerged uh, as a direct consequence of the Enlightenment, so it's hard for me to sort of say that the Enlightenment was bad. But what I like to point out when I'm saying that I'm a counter-enlightenment type is that I don't necessarily believe in some sort of historical necessity, i.e. that things will progress, or even that things should progress, or even that we can identify what progress is. Um, you know, I just did a few videos on Eric Orwell's idea of a master race, where I challenged the idea of being able to define quality in humans. It doesn't mean that I don't believe in human greatness, by the way. I just think that each of us as individuals have to define our own greatness, our own ideas of what it means to be great. Uh, Conference Report just did a good video on um, greatness among nations or ages or things like that. And, you know, it, um, how do you define greatness? I pointed out that Britain at, at about 1890 was at the height of its greatness and that it was rich, powerful, very self-assured, confident, etc. And I kind of find that era boring, whereas starting in the 1920s, England went into something, or Britain, sorry, went into a decline that lasted up until the 1970s. And that period was one of the ones when Britain was at its most interesting. Um, what is the greater period to have lived in? Arguably, the 1930s were a nightmare to live in. But you read George Orwell, and you read especially about his brush with death, or his various brushes with death, say in the Spanish Civil War, where he was shot through the throat or whatever. And he said, I remember the, the line from when, when he was nearly killed. He said, I felt no anger towards the guy who had shot me. And all that I felt was a profound reluctance to leave the world, which at the end of the day suited me so much. Now, <clears throat> he was fighting in the trenches in the Spanish Civil War, and the people that were doing so saw themselves, and I tend to see them, as the ones who fired the first shots against the fascist conquest of Europe, or perhaps the world. Um, it looked The world looked pretty dark and bleak uh, at the time that Orwell was shot. I think it was the winter of 1937. Um, Great Depression is at its height. Fascism is winning everywhere. The only alternative to fascism is this horrific thing called Soviet communism. The democracies aren't interested in the world. They're turning inward. Um, totalitarians are on the march. Jam Japan is on the rampage in the Far East. Uh, you know, this sort of thing. It just wasn't a nice age to live in, overtly speaking. But what an interesting period to live in. Or you ask people about um, having asked people say that lived in London or Glasgow or you know any large British city uh, going through the Blitz or going through the Battle of Britain or going through uh, just the, the entire experience of the war itself it was horrible a couple of hundred thousand people were killed uh, you ran out of supplies just you know Eng England became so poor or the life of the average British person became so poor that um, you know, all you got was the basic necessities, and some sort of war communism took over, and you know, it just became bleak and depressing and, and gray, and everything became kind of ramshackle during the war. Uh, even, and I'm not even referring to the ruins uh, that were created by the bomb, uh, bombing or whatever. But people remember that period fondly, even people who were injured or lost relatives or loved ones, parents, wives, kids, whatever. They say, well, that was. That was our finest hour, as Churchill said. It, it, how do I describe that? Um, and you get the impression, you know, as you do listening to old soldiers, soldiers who are a little bit drunk off their third or fourth pint, talking about their war stories, that you sort of think, these guys, I know that they don't really want to do it again, but this wasn't a purely negative thing for them, that they had to do this. Um, <clears throat> what is it? What, what, what do you call that? where you lived through something horrible, but in hindsight, you're glad you did. Um, I think that 
in the case of, say, the Battle of Britain or the, the way that the British people dealt with the Second World War in general, it's more a case of self-discovery, I think, where you, you, you realize that you had strengths that you didn't know you had. Um, if you, again, you read Orwell and then in, you know when he was talking about Britain up to the uh, advent of the Second World War, he said, we're not ready for this. We can't face this. We're not, psych not psychologically prepared. We don't have the stuff anymore that is necessary to do this. Remember when I was a kid and the great barrel-chested men that went off to fight in Flanders, it was a horrible, um, wasteful experience, but at least we were up to it. We won't be up to it when the bloody fascists start, you know, firing their bombs at us. He was wrong, and he was glad that he was wrong. Um, a lot of British people were sort of astonished at their own strength, you know, exemplified by that meme now, keep calm and carry on. I think a lot of people looked around and they said, well, look, none of my neighbors are panicking. I'm I don't really feel all that panicky, even though my own neighborhood has been blasted into rubble, and people that I've known for years have been killed or whatever. Why am I not freaking out over this? Why am I just sort of cleaning up the mess every day and doing what I can, doing my bit, and I'm not getting enough sleep and I'm worried all the time? But what is this? What's the ultimate nature of what's happening to me here? And I don't mean this in a tub-thumping, patriotic kind of union jack-waving kind of way. I'm just saying people examining themselves, their own reaction to these horrible events. What was that? Why am I not destroyed by this? Because when you sort of think, when you see movies like, say, Things to Come, and you, you, like, you know, a lot of people in Europe believe that mass saturation bombing was on its way in the Second World War, which of course it was, and they thought all that we will have is the downfall of civilization, panic, etc., and that didn't happen. Um, the British people, their nerves held when they were being bombed uh, from the sky. Uh, the first major concerted aerial bombing campaign to break a nation by terrorizing its people, sowing chaos in the very heart of their nation. It didn't work even though people believed that they were going to panic when it happened. <clears throat> what is that? What, what, what is that that happens in each of us as individuals when we find the inner strength to weather a storm, when, when we're living through a horrible time, but something happens inside of us? Some people say it's religion. Some people say that it's inspiration or pride or something like this, which it may very well be. I look at it in a slightly different way. Um, right now we're dealing with um, the possibility of a very divided world. Like we get the phenomenon of Brexit, Trump, um, mass immigration from, er, to, from the developing world to the developed world, the changing demographics of everything, um, the resurgence of China or whatever. And it looks as though the modern world is more and more difficult to come to grips with. What are we to do with this? Do you look at the situation and say, I can't handle this anymore? Or do I have the, the or do I want to have the strength to handle this? Um, do I want to treat this as a Battle of Britain type scenario where I deliberately look for strengths in myself? Or do I want to look at it in a sort of a effete kind of, I don't know, withdrawal from life where I just sort of, I don't want to deal with this anymore? They say that's what um, Paul Cézanne did when the Prussians poured into Paris in 1871. He just went down to the south of France and pretended like none of it was happening. Uh, this war has nothing to do with me. While the, the average French person was traumatized and lots of people had gone to the hills to fight the Prussians, he just sort of said, nothing to do with me. And he went down to Marseille and just painted and forgot about everything, shut himself up in his room. I'm not really criticizing him for that, but what I'm saying is that's a possible response to when you kind of lose your grip on what's happening in the world or you don't really get what is going on. You turn inward as a human being and say, I'm just not going to deal with this anymore. Um, <clears throat> I don't know. Um, 
I don't think you can run from life. I don't think you can run from trouble. Paul, uh, Paul Cezanne might have gone down to Marseille, but you know, another you know, a German fleet could have hove into view into Marseille and it could have followed him there. You, you can't really escape from trouble. Uh, we can't escape from the fact that Brexit has happened. We can't escape from the fact that uh, there's a demographic crisis or a mass immigration crisis now in the modern world. We can't escape from the fact that we live in a confusing and postmodern world. We can't escape from the fact that if we're the sort of person who sees the arrival of Trump as a terrible thing, uh, we can't escape from the fact that he has indeed been elected. End of story. It's happened. So what do you do? Do you hate the, the world that you live in because of the way that it's gone? Or do you love the fact that you have been, that this is your fate to live in this time? You don't have to love the age that you're in. In fact, you can actually dislike the age that you're in. But, you know, if you look at the way certain historical movies are made, say about the Battle of Waterloo or, you know, great historical events, Pearl Harbor or the Battle of Midway or um, any number of things, Joan of Arc even, if that's your bag, or, uh, you know, the battles of the ancient Romans or just, you know, it doesn't. I'm talking about military stuff, I guess, that's crises. But, you know, just any number of eras to have lived in might be horrifying to have lived through, but we want to watch them. We want to watch movies about the Black Death, and we want to wa watch movies about... Um, what we like to watch dystopian fiction and all this kind of thing. Why? Because something in us says that it's possible to have a normal, or not a normal life, but to have a life worth living, even in the worst possible circumstances. You watch these zombie apocalypse movies and TV shows, it's about people attempting to cope with a world that has literally gone mad. And they often show people succeeding in doing this. I think that it's possible to do so. Um, just because Trump gets elected doesn't mean that the world has come to an end. Um, you know, I'm reminded of, you know, Seneca again, Vedius Polio believed in a world in which crystal glasses did not get broken by clumsy slaves. He believed that he had somehow the right to live in a world in which little mishaps didn't happen to him, and that he was being screwed over when dumb little things happened. He believed it was an injustice that that things occasionally went wrong. Uh, deep down, he believed, I have the right to not have to deal with this crap. Well, okay. Do, do you have that right in any absolute sense? You could argue that the people who were bundled into cattle cars and carted off to Auschwitz had the right not to allow, not to have that happen to them, but did that right really make any difference at the end of the day? No. Um, it's going to happen. But you watch a lot of Holocaust movies, or you read Holocaust literature, and darned if these things don't really make you appreciate life even more. Like, how does... Instead of making you curl up and go, that was horrible, and the only thing to do is to escape from that possible fate, a lot of these... A lot of this kind of literature, I guess, or... Um, or uh, would you call it? A lot of that genre says there is a peculiar dignity and a peculiar um, benefit to be had from living through terrible times. Um, you emerge from it a better person. Well, you know, again, a lot of it, it sounds hokey, but you know, it does seem to happen. And what's the secret to doing this? What's the secret to coming out of the Battle of Britain? You know, let's say you're missing your left arm or something like this a better more whole person than before you went in what's the secret to that I think it may be along the lines of Amor Fati it's not that you love the fact that this is happening you choose to love the fact that it is your fate to live in that time and in that place and under those circumstances it's a conscious choice to say I won't be destroyed by this. I won't be discouraged. And in fact, I'm actually going to use all of this horrible stuff that's happening to my own personal advantage. Um, this is a choice I think we can only make for ourselves, but I don't think that it's a particularly... Um, 
um, impossible thing to at least consider. They say, well, what's, how can you possibly tell somebody to love the fact that they're being carted off to Auschwitz? I'm not telling anybody to do that. I'm saying, could I possibly cultivate that in myself? There's a big difference here. There's a big difference between promoting it as an idea and considering it for your own, as it were, consumption. I think that there's simply too much evidence that points to the fact that it is at least possible to do this for us to just dismiss it as a flippant um, band-aid on the horrors of existence. Um, I've simply met people who seem to have emerged from horrible things intact. I rented a room once in Hungary in Budapest for five weeks from an elderly Jewish woman who had the tattoos on her arm and her whole family had been wiped out and she was almost the stereotype of the bubbly um, Jewish grandmother who just, you know, I came home one night morning at about 4 a.m., drunk out of my tree, and I had some girl sitting on my lap the whole night, so her lipstick was kind of smeared on my face and on my clothes. I just looked like a complete mess, a young idiot. And she thought that was the funniest thing that she had ever seen. You know, oh, you naughty little boy, but I guess, you know, men, they, you know, young men, they have to do that. Ha, 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 ha. She was careful to make me a nice breakfast and everything like this the next day and doted on me. And, you know, again, this stereotypical Jewish grandmother. But what she had lived through, you'd think that would have taken her sense of humor away or her sense of her impishness, but it didn't. Um, she wasn't morally offended that I was behaving like this. Uh, and she wasn't, you know, because I really, I wasn't harming her in any way. I tried to sneak in, but she'd waited up sitting in the kitchen for me to come in. So I thought, all right, you caught me. I'm drunk. I'm, I'm a disgrace. What can I do? And she thought it was funny. Um, <clears throat> how do people like that manage to exist when they have gone through so much? She, she dealt with the Holocaust. She dealt with the, her whole family being wiped out. She dealt with God knows how many years of a hellish communist regime in Hungary. The Hungarian one at the early part was one of the harshest of them all. Um, how do you how do you emerge from that still capable of laughing at the foolishness of a young man who makes a fool of himself? Um, I, there just doesn't seem to be any other explanation but love. Love of what? Love of one's own existence in the world.